Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Um, so this presentation is on uh, visual attention. So basically what drives our attention within a space, what attracts uh, uh, our gaze, uh, and where are we tempted to look when we uh, see uh, a given space. Uh, so um, this presentation, uh, uh, so I've worked on this topic with uh, Marilyn Anderson, who is the head of the uh, Laboratory for Integrated Performance in Design at the EPFL in Lausanne. Uh, and um, uh, just a few words to introduce our lab. So our lab is heavily focused on daylighting and we traditionally uh, approach this question from four aspects or four pillars and we like to define them. Uh, the question of comfort where we study aspects related to glare for instance, perception which is uh, everything what we do within uh, the field of virtual reality, health with non-visual effects or energy aspects. And so today, this topic about visual at attraction is highly related to perception. So when we see a space, uh, when we uh, design a space, we always uh, wonder how to make it the best space possible for its users. And virtual reality offers a good way to test a hypothesis, uh, because uh, we can, from this space, take some characteristics we're interested in, for instance, uh, sky condition or uh, space characteristics dimension, we can model them and we can use them to play as variable. And from there, we can uh, uh, use these uh, model scenes as a stimuli to some participants. Of course, if we do that, it's because we, we want to collect data. And this data uh, is uh, subjective data, so for instance perceptual appraisal, or it can be physiological data. So we can imagine uh, heartbeat for instance, but, but we can also imagine uh, eye tracking logs or head tracking logs. And uh, when I joined uh, the LIPID uh, end of last year, I was fortunate because there was a study that had been conducted just before I came which was about perceptual aspect. But during that study, they had also gathered the head tracking logs, actually, because the device, the headset device they used, had a tracker embedded with the logs available. So just a few words about this study, because this is also my data. Um, this was a study about perceptual responses. Uh, it was based on 16 scenes. Uh, all images were black and white, were rendered. Uh, and there was like two sky conditions that were studied. So. Uh, bright, clear sky, which was uh, bringing a lot of shades uh, within the space, and an overcast sky. Uh, it was a 360 fully immersive experience, uh, and uh, human subject testing using VR. Uh, the scene were modeled as cube map, so this is the scene that I received as I was starting this project. And of course, throughout the study, uh, head tracking gloves were uh, uh, gathered, were recorded, and there was about 12 participants for each scene and sky condition. So uh, uh, in total about uh, uh, close to 200 logs. So this was the starting point of my research, and basically uh, I had the scenes and I had the logs, and from there I started to look uh, at the literature on how I can model saliency. So here I'm bringing a new word, uh, it's saliency, it means what's the most prominent in a scene, what is basically attracting us. Uh, and on that, uh, the field of vision and computer science have had roughly 20 years uh, research on that, so it was very interesting to look at all what has been done in these other fields uh, to be able to understand what we can use from there to transfer to our own field, which is building science and architecture. Um, and in parallel to that, it was also the need from these logs that were basically a log of X, Y, Z data to use this, uh, to use this um, coordinates basically to be able to model what I'm going to call a ground truth, which means what can we present where people have looked in the space. So these two, um, I needed these two uh, outputs in order to drive my comparison. Uh, and so basically from there it was a lot of literature and also defining my own methodology, making my own uh, choices in terms of how to process the data. Uh, getting there, uh, I could also compare sky, the effect of sky, because my data set originally was about comparing sky, so each scene is being seen uh, with two sky conditions. 
Um, so the first steps of uh, my uh, silency work was uh, defining the ground truth. And for there, uh, I first needed to define a coordinate systems. And from an XYZ that I decided to go for like a pitch and yo. Um, co uh, coordinate systems, so basically s spherical uh, systems. And the reason why I did that is because it allows me to go with two axes. And so from there, it's much more easier to apply uh, filters or Gaussian or things like that. Uh, one of the constraints is that it disforms the images. And so when you apply filters or when you run silence scripts, you need to take care that a line is no longer a line, but it's a curve. And how does this impact, in turn, our attention? Um, there was the exposure to visual stimuli because uh, the data set that I had didn't have a time limit really. Uh, participants could choose how long they wanted to see a scene and so uh, it was uh, a choice to be made on when to cut the time. Uh, there was also the question of fixation versus saccade because if I move very quickly my head, I might not see what's happening between this point and this point. And so how to make this choice, how to cut a limit to be able to consider only the fixations. Uh, and finally, applying the filter, the Gaussian filter, because otherwise we just have one very precise point, but we are most likely to see actually a region. So what filters, what should be the standard deviation for it to be representative of what might be our experience in the space? <coughs> Uh, that's um, just to explain the challenge that I had with the fixation versus saccade. Uh, there was, a, in the literature, some I, I could see some of the authors or researchers who were taking the threshold of 15, but I noticed it would not even be 20% uh, uh, of the data set. Uh, I tried different uh, threshold. I did some sensitivity analysis. Uh, at the end, I ended up with 60, which was also uh, some of uh, uh, literature references. Uh, and so if I go for the uh, 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 ground truth analysis, um, here you can see a small animation, but this is my different participants and how they would uh, see the space. So one first thing that you may notice is they don't have the time to see everything, and that's true. But the goal is actually not really to give them the time to look at everything, because otherwise everything would be green. The question is what attracts the most our attention? Um, here on the graph, you can see the angular speed, so you can see all of these big spikes that correspond to the, to the moment where we just move our head really quickly. From there, I aggregate all the data, and from there, I apply uh, the Gaussian uh, filter. And you can see, for instance, that here you have a, a big... Uh, a big shape which just corresponds to this few point and this is because of the distortion because the point down at 90 degrees just like one point but with this view it corresponds to uh, an entire line so we need to correct for those artifacts that actually correspond to the uh, coordinate system um, that's another one so this is a different space um, the spaces came from uh, the architecture so uh, in a space that's more horizontal, like the sulfurine here uh, that has been modeled seeing far away from the facade, uh, you can see that it becomes much more horizontal and as a consequence, the ground truths become much more horizontal. So you can see that the way we look is also dependent on the, uh, on the spatial composition we have around us. Um, and so, yeah, this is again the uh, animation. Silency prediction. So our visual attention uh, is driven by two main mechanisms. One is called bottom-up. So this one is, I'm attracted to see a red color. I'm attracted to see a patch of bright light. I'm attracted by direction. So it's uh, mainly what we call low-level features. And then we have top-down attention, which is uh, higher-level features like object cars. And so the early model of silency were heavily based uh, on low-level features, uh, but... Um, um, they were proven not to be that realistic in terms of where we look. And uh, then the latest year has proof uh, deep learning, which allows us to actually learn from images and include within our process some image recognition. Um, there was two models available that I could use to run my saliency analysis, and uh, I was very fortunate to, to find some code and uh, to be able to, to run this model uh, with uh, some help at EPFL. And so in terms of results, here's the result for uh, one of the scene. And we observed that, of course, the map don't correspond, but they are actually quite interesting. For instance, this silence script was able here and here to find out two stairs. 
So in a way, this type of image recognition might uh, have some value. Uh, in the ground truth, actually, we look in the center, but we don't really know. I mean, I was not really able to totally interpret uh, the, 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 the significance to it. And here on, on that silence map, you can see that shadow plays a more important role. So I noticed that the silence script w work very differently. Uh, and when we change scene, we observe uh, some more of these aspects. Uh, these silence scripts have some artifacts. Um, here we can, you can see a red line, a red border, or here you can see that since it works with cube map, it actually models a cube. So these uh, artifacts were not corrected in the script I could uh, g gather from the uh, literature. And um, some more spaces. And this made the numerical comparison of this different scene um, not very, um, not very uh, strong. So here are some um, uh, general results. Uh, so the two scripts work very differently. Both models embed an equator bias because our vision is very much uh, dri driven towards looking at the horizon. Um, some low-level uh, feature could be identified as well as a higher-level feature. Of course, from the qualitative, quantitative perspective, the two models were far to reach uh, close, um, uh, close correlation with the actual ground truth. Uh, but on, on that, on that uh, point, uh, one of the questions is really uh, about um, how are these model trains? Because the model can only be as good as they are trained for. And so when we look at uh, the scene that they have been using in silence prediction, it looks very close from reality where you see picture, color, texture, uh, and, uh, and, and all of that, which also plays an important role in our gaze. So um, how does this compare to our data? I think this can be also discussed later uh, within the, the discussion sessions. Um, I, I wanted to, to tackle another point, uh, and I'm going to go very fast, but how does our viewing uh, behavior change with sky condition? And uh, if we see a clear to overcast sky, um, uh, we, one thing to notice is that um, the viewing pattern present actually higher similarity, just if we look both at the values as well as the ground truth map. And this shows that actually our vision is, is actually space has a very important uh, role in the way we see spaces and sky might actually be rather secondary. But again, this is basically about our viewing party, not about the interest. Claudia, sorry, I will do it the Danish way. I will <laughs> just stop you without being sorry, very polite. <laughs> we well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank Congra you. Congratulations.